Hello everyone, my name is Gillian McKay. I'm the Global Behaviour Change Advisor for Goal Ireland and um, I would like to welcome you all to this webinar. Thanks very much to, to TOPS for, for facilitating this for us. Um, I think it's going to be exciting and interesting and hopefully we'll have a lot of great participation from, from the group. So uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce Alinani Kamlangera. She's our regional uh, gender advisor based out of the Goal Malawi program. And she's going to tell you about some of the research that we've been doing over the past year with, uh, with top support. Um, and uh, yeah, I won't get into it too much because Alan Anu is incredibly well spoken and will be able to give us a really great overview. Um, just to give you a bit of an idea, so Alan Anu will speak for probably about half an hour and then we'll ask Christy Tabaj from TOPS to speak for a few minutes and then I will facilitate the question and answer period. So feel free to put questions into the chat box uh, or um, we can, I'm sure we can uh, figure out how to have you ask your question um, using your microphone uh, in the question and answer period. Great, so thank you very much and I will pass over to Alan Annie. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Gillian, for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, hello. I'll be presenting on the top study. Uh, the prediction is that climate change will have a greater effect on Africa. Uh, this is from the fact that Africa constitutes the majority of the poor, uh, whose livelihoods are dependent on natural resources uh, that are affected by climate change. Uh, in Malawi, it is actually hundreds and thousands that face food insecurity. And this is uh, merely from the fact that uh, Malawi the economy is heavily reliant on agriculture. It, is, it states that almost 80% of rural inhabitants that are above the age of 15 are actually, are actually subsistence farmers, which places Malawi as the, uh, to be number 12 in terms of the most vulnerable um, to and susceptible to uh, disasters. Uh, including floods and droughts. Uh, from, from the fact that Malawi has re, uh, experienced uh, floods and droughts uh, uh, yearly or um, in, most, in most parts of the year, uh, the Malawi government put in place uh, different disaster risk management structures. Uh, these disaster risk management structures were from the village to the district level. And these are what were call, are called uh, the civil protection committees. Uh, despite that, these uh, structures are there. Uh, there still remain gaps uh, within the structures in terms of the of the structures or uh, the structures realizing their roles as well as their responsibilities, especially in regard of uh, gender sensitiveness as well as uh, uh, the requirements of the different gender groups. Next slide. to realize that for Go Malawi to realize the gap that is there, uh, Go Malawi has been working in Malawi since 2002. It works uh, in five districts, uh, which are Sanje, Chikwawa, Balaka, uh, Neno, as well as uh, Blanca Rural. It works in different uh, programs. Uh, some of them are livelihood, climate change, health, nutrition, disaster reduction. And one of the programs that uh, Go Malawi works in is the Discover program. That is a consortium uh, consisting of Concern Universal, as well as Kupi, as well as government stakeholders. Um, within this project, Go Malawi works on uh, climate change, as well as the work with the different uh, structures that were set up by government. And um, within our work with, this, the with the different structures, we realized that... Um, we realized that... Um, we realized 
that there was a gap in the way that uh, the structures were responding to the needs of uh, men, women, girls, boys and uh, girls. That's when uh, we came up with this research study uh, that was accepted through SART. Within the top uh, study, uh, the, we came up with the objectives, which were we would have, we would like, we wanted to investigate the impact of gendered vulnerability to climate change and disasters on the food security of women, girls, boys, and men. Uh, another objective was to develop guidelines and recommendations that were based on the research findings for resilience programming specific to food security, which will in turn strengthen disaster preparedness, prevention, response, and mitigating measures that were appropriate and relevant for women, girls, boys, and men. What methodology did we use to carry out the study? We used qualitative methods, and within the qualitative methods, we did a desk review of literature that was both international as well as national literature. Uh, we had focus group discussions with women, men, boys, and girls. Uh, the focus group discussions uh, carried uh, 10 people. And um, the, we would just let the community, uh, would rather walk into the community and um, speak to the leaders who would uh, then give us a choice of the women, uh, who, or men or boys and girls who would be able to talk to us. Um, we also were able to do uh, case studies with uh, women, men, boys and girls within evacuation camps. And we also had key informant interviews with government personnel that were from the Department of Agriculture as well as uh, disaster, disaster risk uh, reduction as well as uh, gender-based violence technical working groups uh, within the different uh, districts. Um, we also used uh, the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index. We adapted the instrument to measure women's output within the disaster situation. Uh, we're also able to hold feedback meetings at national and district levels. And these meetings were held after all the data was collected, and what we would do was we'd go back to the villages and meet uh, different representatives uh, of uh, the different gender groups, would sit down and give them the data that we've collected, and then we would have them feedback on the information that we had, if, if uh, they had anything to add on to, or if they had wanted to recommend something that wasn't there. And after that, we also presented the findings from uh, the different districts to at national level, where we had different donors, but also representatives from government, uh, who feedback on the information that we had, as well as the recommendations. And thereafter, we also sent the recommendations and uh, had feedback at international level from uh, both different uh, advisors, as well as uh, at a core conference uh, that was um, where the findings were presented. Um, and after that, we also collected, or rather within the process, we also collected quantitative methods, uh, quantitative data. Uh, the quantitative data uh, was basically a questionnaire that had demographic information and also key questions that were around the experience of the people that we were speaking to in regards to drought Uh, within our getting ready to go to the field, uh, Malawi was hit by heavy rainstorms and floods. And it was within 15 districts out of the, 20, the, the 28 that are there that were hit by these uh, floods. And it, it is 638,000 that were affected. And from, there, from those, it was 230,000 that were displaced 
and 104 were confirmed for dead. Uh, the three most, the, the three worst affected districts uh, were Nsanje, Chikwawa, and Kalombe. And Nsanje uh, was reported to have the highest number of displaced persons and the people that and people that were missing. Um, Sanji was one of the districts that we collected our data, and um, among uh, the, the other districts were rather Neno and Blanda Rural. And uh, within our collection of data, we chose uh, two TAs, which are in, in Malawian context, that would mean a traditional authority. This is a local leader who heads several village heads within a territory. And uh, within that territory, we then chose five group village heads. So those would be, uh, that would be a local leader who heads several villages. And the slide that I, the slide that I have there uh, just uh, showcases um, where we collected the data, as well as the people that we interviewed, as well as the evacuation camps that we visited. Uh, the next slide uh, shows the demographics, the total number of people uh, in terms of the gender groups that we uh, sat down with. In terms of men, we spoke to a total number of 216, that's a maximum, who are, were of a maximum age of 72, and the minimum age was 18, the average age was 14. Uh, with women, we were able to talk to 304 uh, women, uh, who were maximum age was 80, the minimum age was 18, and the average age was 49. With girls, we were able to talk to 292 girls, who were of a maximum age of 26, of the minimum age of 10, and an average age of 14. With boys, we had 295 uh, boys, who were a maximum age of 28, and the minimum age of 9, and an average age of Uh, now I move on to the findings. These findings are in terms of the disaster reduction, uh, what the communication of intending is that how women, men and boys and girls told us how they were what to hear of uh, intending floods or droughts. Women say that they were able to know that floods or droughts were pending. Uh, because of the intensity of the wind, but also late rains and heavy rains, by also listening to the radio, uh, but also village crier, people that moved around the village and uh, spoke of the impending events, uh, but also from village meetings and also from flowing of certain rivers that, uh, that overflowed at a particular time, but also from other people within the village, but also from district committees and the chiefs councillors. Men say that they've all heard of the impending events by, uh, from the radio, by reading newspapers, through campaigns run by NGOs, e.g. Go Malawi, uh, but also through agriculture extension workers, uh, observation of their harvest, um, but also government awareness campaigns, uh, but also through other NGOs, the internet, and indigenous knowledge. And one example would be the constant falling of a particular species of caterpillars, uh, which uh, showcased that there were impending floods. But also uh, other examples would be the direction that birds would be stalking. Uh, that would also tell them of uh, upcoming floods. Girls say that they hear, they get their communication from radios, from the television, from their parents, from their relatives, from the elderly, from community committees, from studying the weather. And boys say that they hear of the impending events through radio, Ministry of Agriculture, through awareness campaigns, agriculture extension workers, NGOs awareness campaigns, from chiefs at community meetings, from community-based children's care, from indigenous knowledge, but also the change of weather and 
from a newspaper, local newspaper within the Sanjib district called Fugo and from also climate change officers. Uh, this is just a picture show facing a flooded river uh, where different uh, women from uh, different villages are trying to cross over to a trading center. Uh, this slide is on how the different groups said that we prepared, and these uh, findings were universal to four gender groups. They said that they prepared for the upcoming uh, disasters by increasing their household capital. Uh, this would mean that they would be taking up uh, different uh, ways of uh, making sure that they had enough money or they had um, enough items that would be able, that would make them resilient to upcoming floods. They would also establish small businesses. Uh, for example, they would be selling charcoal, they would also sell beignets, um, they would also sell scones and all sorts. Uh, but also they say that they engage in modern farming techniques, for instance, uh, conservation agriculture, but also they would uh, 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 do box bridges within their farms, they would also rent land within the wetlands. They would also plant drought resistant crops, but they would, and also plant species of trees that they knew would conserve water. They would practice agroforestry. They would store and ration food. Uh, they would build makeshift leaves. They would transfer or their property to upper land. They would also rent canoes um, in expectations of their coming upcoming floods. But they would also keep livestock to sell during the disasters. They would also eat uh, uh, water lilies uh, that are locally called as nyuka. And there were actually others that said that they did not prepare at all because they felt that uh, this was an emergency and there was no way, there's no way one can, can prepare for an emergency. Or rather to say that uh, this is nothing, it's, it's something that um, it's a known, and nobody knows what particular time this would happen, so they wouldn't be able to prepare. Uh, in terms of the gender findings and how the different groups prepared, women say that they preserve vegetables. Uh, they did this by uh, drying uh, the vegetables. Some say that they boiled them to eat at a later date, uh, but also they manage family consumption. Well, whereby they're the ones that are responsible uh, of um, what the family eats. So they would ration the food so that they, it, was, it, it would last longer to the time that uh, the disaster hit. Uh, some women say that they joined savings and loan groups. Uh, some say that they reminded their husbands to prepare for the floods. Uh, some say that they adopted family planning methods. Uh, one woman from uh, an FGB, uh, from GBH Ketanala said, we take contraceptives to avoid unplanned pregnancy. That leads to increased mass deaths. Um, as of men, men say that they prepared by renting land in the wetlands. They look for farming tools, uh, but also they buy supplementary food. They build houses and structures upland. Uh, they encouraged their wives to save food, and some men say that they migrated to Jambao, Mozambique, to work in the mines. Girls say that they prepared for floods uh, by uh, dropping out of school. This was to help their parents to uh, in preparation of the floods. Uh, but also, th some girls say that they just rely on their parents to show them. Uh, what they need to do. Uh, boys say that they also help their their parents in preparation of the floods, and there were a lot of boys that say that they did not prepare for the floods. Uh, this is just a picture showing the effect of climate change on crops. So this is a picture that was taken in Sanjib after the flood had uh, had come through. Uh, findings on disaster response, uh, these are universal experiences of disasters, how the different groups uh, spoke of the experiences of, of floods and droughts. Um, 
they think that casual labor within this time uh, is very scarce. And this is the, from the mere fact that a lot of people are looking for the same opportunity to get uh, casual labor. Uh, most of them sleep hungry. Uh, they say that commodities become expensive. Uh, they lack the basic necessities, for instance, soap, uh, lotion, uh, because um, they don't have the money. Um, but also, there's a noticeable presence of the disabled within the market. Uh, disabled, the disabled come in and uh, uh, beg for food as well as money. Uh, there's no choice of food uh, that they eat, whether it's nutrition or not. Um, for instance, uh, the water lily, the nuka, they, a lot of people think that uh, it caused um, um, cramps uh, in one stomach, but despite that, they're still forced to eat that. Uh, but also the fact that they, they're not choosing in terms of whether the food is clean or is hygienic. They just have, they, they eat it for the mere fact that they are hungry. But also they spoke of the risk that lies with gathering nuka because uh, the nuka is found um, deep down the rivers, so they have to go under the river to collect this nuka, which puts them at risk of uh, being caught by crocodiles as well as people. And also, when they're looking for banana roots, they risk the risk of um, being uh, uh, beaten by snakes. But also there's a change in sleeping patterns because they, they're hungry, but also within the different towns, uh, the accommodation that is there is not um, what they used to. It's, uh, it's very, there's little accommodation. The, the tents are very small to accommodate the number of people that are uh, put in one camp. But also uh, they spoke of idleness and boredom where they just, um, because they're within a camp, they're forced to just sit and look at each other because it's not the same, they're not staying in the same place that they used to or probably don't have the, farm, the land to farm like they usually do. Some people say that they suffer from nutrition-related diseases. There's a lot of absenteeism from school and homework is not done because uh, at that particular time, uh, children are hungry and... Um, School is not necessarily their priority, but also they spoke of the pain for children of God. They spoke of um, losing their loved ones, seeing uh, their loved ones uh, drowning as well as dying. And they also spoke of uh, not having enough tents within the camp and being embarrassed for having to sleep naked because at the particular times when the floods come, people were not prepared. Um, they come. Sometimes they come during the night when they're asleep. They also spoke of sleeping without mosquito nets at the pumps and that they had to share uh, bathroom spaces, which were not always hygienic for the different people that are put in one place. And some people's priorities are not always necessarily um, being hygienic. Um, in terms of the gendered experiences, women spoke of uh, that they did not have a balanced diet for pregnant and lactating women. Um, within the camps, most of the, at that, at the most times, the food that is provided is, um, is, is not enough. And uh, women spoke of prioritizing the kids uh, rather than them having something to eat. And the food is, they don't really have a choice or say in the matter. Most of the times, you um, it's a local dish is uh, the staple food, which is steamer and beans. Uh, but also other women spoke of having problems in accessing anti-mental services. In terms of the uh, floods, the fact that uh, roads would be inaccessible at this particular time. The women in Menno specifically, they spoke of the fact that the, the hospitals or the clinics were far from where they were staying and had to walk along the streets to get there. But also some women spoke of increased uh, workload and that also couples do not have intimate relationships because uh, the camps were not necessarily places that um, a man and a woman can uh, meet. Um, and they also spoke of uh, child care and the fact from the fact that it's compromised within throughout women spoke of having to leave their children with uh, younger siblings 
space for them to grow and look for food. Um, they also spoke of challenges in the usage of toilets within camps by pregnant women. This was uh, from the fact that uh, within the camps it was very dark and uh, pregnant women would constantly leave the toilet. And just that space, the toilets were very dark. It was very uh, difficult for them to access them. They had to depend on older women who understood their situation and were willing to help them to the toilet. But also, there's a desire with the government of young couples because it's different people brought together. And um, um, it's uh, different attitudes as well as different behavior. Uh, there's not enough sleeping spaces, and women in most cases are the ones that are discriminated in choosing children. Uh, women also say that they, rather, women are said to also become promiscuous because they're trying to fend for themselves in a situation where they're desperate. There's one man that says that uh, most women have become promiscuous and have changed their dress, their way of dressing to attract men so that they have something to eat at the end of the day. That's a man from uh, Nina. Men say that uh, the experience has been that their wives disobey them and their husbands say the wives become weak. This was from the male side that they say that their wives did not they felt that the men weren't able to provide uh, as they were doing before. Uh, men say that they also did not have enough time to spend with their families as they are trying to find means of feeding their families. Um, but also, men are unable to take part in development from the fact that they might go to uh, different areas looking for work, um, like in Zimbabwe and Mozambique. But also that men feel helpless and that they feel that they have failed their families. Uh, also men felt that they are not intimate and uh, with their wives and this makes them resort to sleeping with prostitutes. They also failed to give the basic uh, necessities to their children and say that their marriages are taken. Uh, girls spoke of the experiences to be uh, that a lot of them drop out of school. This was because they would want to uh, get out of uh, their, their rather in that they're desperate. They would uh, uh, get into early marriages just so that they uh, have somebody who would be able to provide for them. Uh, in that also parents no longer encourage them to go to school. They would actually force them to get married so that uh, the burden is lessened. Uh, also, some girls are said to be mean and irritable because they're hungry and um, they don't see the need to be friendly and they're forced to be mean. Uh, also, girls say that they do not play as much as they would, or some say that they do not play at all, and that uh, uh, girls are forced to run drunk um, and at times not at all. Uh, during the dry spells, uh, even when they were menstruating. And some other girls say that they uh, they resort to prostitution. Uh, boys spoke of their experiences to be they were absent from school as they go looking for casual labor. They were insulted by friends when they visit, in that when they visit their friends, most of the times their friends will think that they're there to eat, and uh, the friends might not be as friendly. Uh, because they don't have enough food and also they spoke of an increase in their workload uh, where one boy said from Sojin said that we worry that some responsibilities that were our fathers before on us at a young age as boys we also get to do more work than everyone else because we are boys which affects us at other times there's circumstances where we are sent out of our parents houses to stay in our house so that the number of mouths to feed uh, some spoke of peer pressure, where they resort to smoking uh, marijuana as well as drinking. Um, uh, but also, some say that uh, they did not have time to socialize with their friends and girls as much as uh, they did before. Uh, but also, there's a lack of respect between fathers and sons because at certain times, uh, or rather at most times, sons are placed uh, older boys are placed in the same uh, camps with their fathers. 
this is just a picture showcasing uh, the plant in, in January that was set up in uh, one of the districts in Chikwawa. And uh, this is uh, an example of a makeshift toilet. Um, this was the toilet that was set up uh, just after the disaster hit, or probably some weeks into uh, the disaster. Um, what we have here are potentials, uh, communications, uh, rather uh, recommendations from the community. Different women, men, boys and girls spoke of uh, their experiences as well as how they felt uh, of the disasters. So this is just to probably give a general idea of um, some of um, the recommendations that came from the community. This is a woman from uh, Benji who says, women are at a great advantage, especially those with more children, because they have to look for food. While women sacrifice their bedding, to give them to the children, while men do not care. They are more widows, most women are divorced, separated. A lot of men run away from marriages and since men are collectible. Um, this quotation just shows us um, where, uh, just gives an idea of uh, how women feel or what women experience within disasters or in general. Um, and a man, I have a quotation here from a man from Chitomeni, Damira, who says, now we are receiving aid, but there will be a time when food aid would stop being given. We are afraid of that time. What will we do then That time, when that time comes? Our fears are about how we are to provide for our children, how to give them the basic necessities, because at this point I have no money or property. And when my child asks for something, for example, shoes, I cannot give anything because I have nothing. I also fear for my marriage because soon enough my wife will perceive me as a failure because I cannot provide her with what she's used to. And there are other men who want to take advantage of my failing because they have money. And what of my children? Will they not decide to become prostitutes just so that they can buy the basic things? This is uh, from a man uh, within the um, camps after floods had reached uh, one of the quotations from a boy, uh, from uh, Ndamera, says, the committees should include boys in their meetings and programs as this will ensure that boys' ideas are represented in the committee. This will also help in building the boys' knowledge of their communities, which will help them in becoming better community leaders in the future. We would also like to be given livestock or loans to start up businesses, which we can give back thereafter. Uh, this is a boy just expressing um, uh, their need to be included in the um, uh, different community meetings as well as the programs uh, that take place within his community. Uh, another quotation from a girl from Benje says, Yes, we are different. When girls face hardships, they opt for early marriages or engage in prostitution. When a boy impregnates a girl, it is a girl who drops out of school. And suffer the consequences. Girls are also given more household chores than boys. At the same time, we're forced to do the household chores whilst the boys are sent to school. This is a girl just expressing the difference that's there between her and a boy and boys. Um, this is just a snapshot of the final recommendations that we came up with. Um, and uh, these recomm this recommendation here is uh, from a situation, a drought situation, and it's, it's uh, within the theme of agriculture. We say that female and male, and male farmers should be encouraged as part of government, iron job civil society-led agriculture interventions to diversify crops, e.g. plantains, cassava, sweet potatoes, as this facilitates medical habits throughout the seasonal calendar, reflecting the different growing and Drought tolerant crops should also be prioritized as well as nutrition sensitive agriculture. Government iron Joe civil society led organizations who engage in food distribution should ensure timelines for distribution are in line with seasonal calendar, taking specific account of the uh, 
uh, another recommendation within that was uh, within the theme of child protection, saying uh, the value of education for all children, in particular girls who are disproportionately uh, disadvantaged in terms of school enrollment and completion, should be taught to the parents to avoid negative coping mechanisms in times of disaster, e.g. drought. Such negative coping mechanisms may include early marriage for young girls, and the designing the designing for behavior change approach could assist in identifying barriers and mitigation. Um, another recommendation that falls under a flag in terms of preparedness, uh, we say that the safety of younger children and people with disabilities should be included in decision making to ensure the constructive participation of all stakeholders. The participation of all stakeholders should also include recommendations from all to help make collective decisions on allocating land for suitable habitation. Make sure that um, um, the decisions are uh, participated from all the different gender communities. Another one of the recommendations is under the theme of education. We say that provision of entertainment and entertainment should form part of camp management and protection programs, placement programs, topics such as sexual and reproductive health should be included. Um, within the findings, uh, different groups spoke of being bored and uh, saying that uh, they were idle. So um, we thought that it would be good uh, to have some sort of entertainment as well as uh, entertainment uh, within the different camps. Um, how this uh, study has impacted on goal programming. Um, this has impacted on goal programming in the fact that our response to disaster, for instance, when we did the camp assessment, uh, when we spoke to women about them having problems, uh, pregnant women having problems in the toilets because of the darkness that surrounded the camp, we were able to give uh, solar light to the different camps, but we were also able to uh, distribute mosquito nets and um, we're also able to build uh, toilets uh, within different camps. But also this has, uh, or rather will affect our implementation of program activities uh, within livelihood uh, programs. Uh, for instance, in the, uh, before our recommendations, uh, we realized that women's uh, knowledge is at different levels. And um, or uh, rather not women, rather uh, the gender group knowledge of uh, agriculture is at different levels. So our training within the livelihood program will make sure that that is taken into consideration. It has also impacted on our programming in that uh, our seeking, uh, our process of seeking out proposals have been influenced by the recommendations. Uh, for instance, our sorting out. Um, uh, projects that are within, that are looking at uh, climate change as well as uh, uh, as well as family planning. Thank you. That's the end of my presentation. Great. Thanks so much, Alanani. Um, I, uh, I think a few times you, you got a little bit quiet, but I, I was able to hear the whole way through, so I, I hope that the recording as well captured it. Um, and it was a really interesting presentation. Uh, I'd like to pass over to uh, Christy from TUP, who can give us a little bit of kind of contextualization and um, yeah, maybe round us out a little bit, and then we'll come back for questions and uh, questions and answers. Many thanks, Jillian, and I want to extend a great big thanks to Elanani for her presentation. Um, I know that she has been an integral part of this grant, and I'm thankful that Elanani, you were able to present today. Thank you so much. Um, I want to just, for those of you who may have joined us late, I just wanted to um, once again emphasize that this was uh, this project. This Research was possible through a TOPS grant, and TOPS grants, the small grant program, is currently closed, and we're hoping that it reopens. But this small grant came at a time um, when, unfortunately, Malawi was experiencing some of its heaviest flooding that it has seen in many years. 
And so we were able to, or Goal was able to capture some of it, some of the research elements that we wouldn't have seen had there not been a disaster. So um, although it wasn't, we didn't, there was no planning around this type of, of circumstance, I think that Goal was able to really capture some of that learning and, and as they mentioned, take it forward in future programming. And one of the key points that I recognized in this in the research findings and then this during this presentation has to do with the fact that gender, there really is an important gender aspect in in these types of situations. Um, seeing that there are different perceptions among men, women, boys and girls is a key element in recognizing that we cannot find a one size fits all solution for all issues and gaps that we encounter within programming. And so I think that this can really carry on through a lot of different uh, contexts and other types of projects, recognizing that there are gender differences in how we need to approach and have strategies for activities around um, resilience, around climate change programming uh, and livelihoods programming is really such a key issue. Um, and I think it's also important to see that uh, these types of strategies, uh, we can kind of, we, we really do need to think outside of the box when it comes to thinking about some of the strategies and activities needed. Uh, towards the end of the presentation, Elenani had mentioned that there, uh, that designing for behavior change, behavior change uh, strategies and activities can be uh, one of the key components to addressing some of the gender differences. And there are a number of resources available through the, the FSN network that you can access, and I encourage you to do so. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hand it back over to Jillian and Elenani for the question and answer session. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Christy. And, uh, and I think you, you brought up some really great points um, about how, you know, uh, it, it wasn't expected <laughs> uh, that there would be these kind of flooding, this kind of flooding um, at the time. And I think the team in Malawi, I have to, I think everybody at Goal, and I, and I appreciate you guys at TOPS as well, uh, really gave them a big shout out for, for managing to get this research done in a really, really tough situation. And um, and I think get some really interesting information that hopefully is generalizable beyond just the Malawi context for anybody who's facing um, a kind of unexpected disaster in a long-term resilience type project and how gender impacts on that. Um, I see that Hans has a question. He's typing in the chat box just now. Um, so I, I'm not sure if I can maybe pass over to Hans to actually ask it in person or if he just wants to type it. That's maybe easiest. <laughs> Um, but uh, maybe Alan Annie, while we're waiting on Hans, can I ask a question? Um, before you got the uh, the research started, you were planning to do this more of a kind of a long term resilience type quest, uh, kind of project study, not relating so much to kind of the flooding that occurred. Do you think the results that you found would have differed in any way um, had there not been the flooding uh, this year? Alanani, are you there? Oh. Have we lost her? <laughs> oh, that's a shame. <laughs> Sorry, we've got lots of great questions coming up, so it would be really nice to, uh, to get Alanani back so we can hear from her. There you are. There you are. Did you hear my question, Alanani? Oh, no, oh, no, I didn't. I didn't. The end of it. Okay, let me ask again, and then we've got a few more questions that have come up for you. So mine first, though, because I'm, I'm like that. Uh, do you think your results would have differed if there hadn't have been the floods this year? I think 
yes i think uh, the fact that uh, uh, the floods happened we're able to leverage uh, real experiences you know it had just happened and it was very clear in people's minds their experiences uh, so i think um, yes i think it would it, it was that definitely um, added uh, value to the fact that we're able to to leverage the real experiences to refresh in people's minds. Great, thanks so much. That's brilliant. Um, I'm going to read off the question for you here, Alanani, from Han. So um, uh, I think he's quite keen to get an answer. He says, in order to address gender imbalances before disasters occur, how can behavior change communication impact on the systems so that gender considerations are made by the populations themselves? So I think a really great question there about how kind of community empowerment and community decision making around the behavior change uh, processes that they undertake for resilience uh, can, uh, can impact on disasters. What's your thinking, Alanani? Can you read that again? In order to address gender imbalances before disasters occur, how can behavior change communication impact on systems um, so that gender considerations are made by populations themselves? It's, uh, it should be visible there on your presenter notes as well. Uh, so, in order to address gender imbalance, I, 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 I think um, I would say making sure that it's more of a of men, women, boys, and girls that are sitting within the different st structures within the community, uh, making sure that uh, it is uh, both at, uh, with the systems, the people that are involved with uh, taking this message to the community but also making sure that um, the context to background of the communities is well known. Um, what kind of uh, behaviors, who does what? So as much as we want to change different uh, behaviors, we should, we, we should also be very mindful of the context because uh, the different, uh, the different, different contexts have uh, present different situations for the four gender groups. So it's very important to make sure that within our, our, our uh, implementation of any activity is mindful of that, but also to make sure that the people that we're addressing, the message that we're carrying is addressing the both all the gender groups, but also the people that are taking that message are of the different gender groups. Great. Thank you so much, Alanani. That's brilliant. Good, good, good. Uh, so I think maybe there was another question. I'm just looking at the chat box here to see what else we have. Um, there's a question from, uh, I, I apologize, I'll probably pronounce this wrong, uh, Narua. Is, Narua, is this a question for Alanani about, uh, about TOPS or was that a specific question to, um, to Christy? Because she's answered in the TOPS box there, in the box. Okay, no problem. All right. Uh, I mean, I haven't got any more questions in the chat box. Does anybody else have a question they'd like to ask? Christy has a question. <laughs> Christy, do you want to unmi unmute your microphone and ask the question uh, in voice? Sure. I actually, so actually have a couple, have a couple, of, couple questions, of questions, but I'll just I'll pose one right, one right now. I'm curious if there was any increase in gender-based violence observed or noted during this research period. I did see during uh, the, you know, the results, the, the uh, questions that were asked in the different focus groups that there was some um, mention 
around intimacy issues, but I'm curious if there was anything mentioned about violence. anything in particular that there wasn't anything in particular that was mentioned like for instance for a woman to say that my husband uh, uh, beats me or rather to say that my wife beats me but um, I would say that uh, it was also I think it would I don't know I wouldn't say that there was anything that came out uh, in regards to CBD. Uh, I think it would mean specifically uh, asking questions on that in particular. I think for it to come out, but just from from the uh, from the results that we collected, there wasn't anything that uh, maybe in the sense that. Uh, women were afraid to, in certain situations, women were not able to go to the toilet because it was dark. Uh, probably the fact that the toilet, for instance, like the toilet that was there, was uh, it had uh, plastic around it, around it, and it was near to a bush. So in that context, um, women uh, did speak of um, they're not having enough privacy, but not necessarily in terms of being abused, I would say. Nothing in, in that sense came out. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Alanani. Um, yeah, I think some of the recommendations came up that maybe were uh, definitely kind of followed on from some concerns around GBV specific to things like um, like extra lighting in the camps and more toilets and stuff like that. So uh, even if it didn't come out as directly uh, a comment from participants, I think it came out in the recommendations, which was really a strength of the approach of creating the recommendations that it kept going back to the community to ask for their thoughts and their thoughts and more of that. Um, do you want to ask another question, Christy, or should we ask Hans maybe to... Why don't you ask the question, Christy, while Hans, uh, Hans writes his, uh, his question? Okay, great. I have a short question, and that has to do with one of the responses given in, um, by the men around how they prepare for uh, impending disasters or potential disasters, and that is there was mention that they rent land in the wetlands, and I'm not clear about that. Could Alanani, could you clarify that? Is do they do they they have land in the wetlands and they try to rent it, or they're trying to get land in the wetlands? Um, they would try to get land in the wetlands in the sense that it would be closer to probably the river. So they rent it because there are other people that already have land there. So when uh, the dry spell, they would want to they would want land within that area so that they're able to engage their Perfect. Thanks very much. Um, I think there's a really interesting question in the chat box here from Greg that uh, maybe is a bit of a discussion question, not necessarily for yourself, Alanani, although I'd love to get your thoughts on it, but maybe for others as well, including um, Christy and, and maybe other people in the, in the audience, audience or participatory <laughs> environment. So the question is, when we talk about resilience in general, do you think this will be a new facet to grant proposals? And if so, will this require increased budget demands on donors? And I mean, maybe I'll just put my kind of two cents in about that one, and then maybe we'll ask kind of Christy and Alanani and anybody else who would like to comment to do so. Um, I think resilience is just really good programming. It's about it's about making sure that whatever you're doing uh, is 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 has a long-term sustainable impact, and isn't just about kind of fixing the immediate problem, but really about uh, about considering how can we support the communities that we work with to be more resilient to shocks. So, um, and and we've got a. I had a really great um, 
uh, talk by one of our resilience advisors just a few weeks ago. And she was saying that pretty much everything that we're doing already is resilience programming. It's just about bringing it out more clearly and making it very clear how it all links in together to kind of maintain the kind of community's empowerment and community strength. So that's just kind of my, uh, my thinking on that. Does anybody else have any thoughts on, on resilience? Jillian, I'll tell you quickly I'll, that I, I, I agree with, I agree with what, you what you said, that there really is an emphasis on, there, it already exists. Good programming can also be uh, perceived or seen or viewed as, as resilience programming, so absolutely. And I, the donor is paying attention, and I do think that by calling out uh, certain activities that, that perhaps there will be more funding options uh, just by highlighting that the activities that are taking place are seen as resilience activities. But I agree, it's, it's about doing good programming that helps people prepare for those shocks. Great, thanks Christy. Um, so let me, uh, there's a few more questions here, so let's have a quick look. Uh, so, uh, Alan, I mean, this is a question for you. It says from Hans, um, it seems like in responses given by different groups as to how they hear about impending events, men have greater access to outreach campaigns and extension services and are reading, reading newspapers to inform themselves while women did not cite this. What does this seem to imply to you? Is it that women have lower literacy level and participation in government and NGO outreach? It's a really great question about access to information, I think. Alan, any your thoughts? Uh, yes, I think uh, definitely that men have uh, greater access to uh, information. Um, uh, even for within our trainings, um, you get that uh, a lot of men, uh, the ones that come to these trainings, to the point that we've actually made it a requirement to make sure that uh, within our message to the community when we're inviting for them for a specific training. It needs to be inclusion of both men and women. Because most times uh, within these trainings, um, men are the ones that are actually uh, thought to be the ones to have knowledge or rather to, or to, to understand for the message that we're bringing. So I would say men usually um, run for this opportunity. Um, so I would say yes, and even in terms of um, access to uh, newspapers or even the literacy levels, it's mostly men that are educated, especially in an area like the uh, A lot of women usually um, get married early and uh, do not have the opportunity. Actually, the literacy levels in uh, Sanjay are very horrific, so it's mostly men that are literate compared to women. Great, thanks very much, Alan Uh So there's two questions left in the chat box, and I think, um, ah, and Hans says thanks very much. Uh, there's two questions left, left in the chat box. I think we'll take those and then we'll log off because we've gone, we're going to go over by a few minutes. Um, so there's a question here from Adam about uh, whether the outcome of this work, this research, has resulted in any changes in programming or in program planning. And I know you mentioned a few pieces at the end there, Elenani, but would you like to expand on that at all? Yeah, I think uh, I would speak on, for instance, our emergency response. Uh, how are we going to respond uh, to the different uh, uh, situations within Malawi? Uh, this knowledge that we now have will help us in making sure that our response is tailor-made to the needs of men, women, boys, and girls. Um, like I was mentioning, for instance, to make sure that um, there's lighting within the camp, or to also try and make sure that um, there are enough camps that would um, that are uh, that will uh, be enough for both men, women, and uh, children to probably try our best. We also provide uh, some sort of entertainment as well as entertainment. So uh, 
definitely now our emergency response will be better and will be tailor made to the findings to make sure that we cover the needs of uh, all four gender groups. But also probably in looking at uh, what is missing within our puzzle, like we're talking about resilience and making sure that it's a full package that we're taking to the community to make sure that uh, livelihood, nutrition, uh, what is resilience uh, within that and uh, being able to offer that to the community uh, with uh, a gendered lens, I would say. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, and then a final question from Hunt, and I think it wraps up the, um, this, this webinar beautifully, uh, is um, what are the implications uh, of this research for programming in different sectors? So I mean, obviously this was focused around kind of food security, um, but uh, what is your thinking on how this applies to other sectors that, uh, that people might be working in? Their recommendations are thematic. So they're very well um, placed in that somebody from nutrition would want to help uh, build resilience in terms of um, uh, different situations. And they'll be able to pick up and say, well, um, within my sector, this is what I could do for men or for women. Uh, so I think uh, the different uh, sectors uh, will be able to look at the recommendations and apply to the different situations or rather, uh, uh, I guess, highlight, uh, the study highlights uh, the different approaches that or the different um, needs of uh, the different gender groups. So I would say, yeah, the implications are that. And that every sector, uh, not every sector, but at least most of the sectors are represented within the recommendation. So one can pick up and say, well, this is how I can improve, or I, I can offer a gender response to my sector. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, well, I'd like to. Um, wrap up. We've gone a few minutes over, but I think uh, that was a great final answer and I really wanted, want to thank you, um, Alanani, for all your hard work, you and the Malawi team, on putting this research together and I think coming up with a really great report that um, I believe, actually maybe I'll get clarification, <laughs> um, is, is going to be published. So it's, it's easily accessible in report form um, and as well this webinar has been recorded, so if you want to pass this on to any of your colleagues in uh, in your organizations or other organizations, that's definitely possible. Um, I think that uh, the question answer made it very clear that this research is applicable beyond just the Malawian context. There's some really great uh, lessons that have been learned from this and some great recommendations showing that it's not just about food security and livelihoods and gender, it's about child protection and family coherence and, and, and health and all of this. So, uh, Alanani, thank you so much, and thanks so much to TOP uh, for their support um, on this research. Sometimes it can be hard to kind of try try new things with with, uh, with donor funding, and I think that was the really best part about working with TOP is they were willing to take a, a chance on something a little bit different. Um, Alanani, do you want to just say something quick to to sign off, and then we're going to pass over to Jesse to to finish up the uh, the webinar. Thank you very much for taking the time thank to you very much for and to listening in to the presentation. Um, yeah, uh, we hope you be able to get a copy of the report in itself. I think there's much more than the presentation. Uh, but otherwise, thank you very much for listening and for your time. And thank you to Top for giving us this opportunity. Great. Thank you so much, Alianani. This was an awesome presentation, and we are very excited to be a part of it. Um, for all of you who are listening in and participating, uh, please know that this recording and the presentation will go up onto the fsnnetwork.org. That is TOPS's knowledge sharing platform that's online. Um, so please stay tuned. Look out for that. Uh, if you have any questions about the webinar today or the TOPS Small Grants Program 
or anything that TOPS does, or, any, or if you need to get in touch with Ali Nani or Jillian, please reach out to us. Uh, we are happy to answer questions. And thank you again. Have a fantastic day.